Well, um, we've arrived this morning at Joshua chapter 22, and as you can see, I've titled today's message, as of now, clarifying a huge misunderstanding. Now, we've arrived at the concluding chapters of the book of Joshua. There's only three more left, 22, 23, and 24, and I'm still hoping that I'll be able to finish this um hopefully next week we'll see see how it goes uh, it's all you know to the lord but these concluding chapters in the book of joshua would all will all deal will will all deal with with farewells of sorts chapter 22 contains joshua's farewell to the warriors whose tribes settled east of the Jordan River. Chapter 23 will relate to Joshua's first farewell address. And when we get to chapter 24, it was, it's going to recount his second and more well-known farewell address and will be followed by notices of the deaths of Joshua and Eleazar. Just to give you guys a little bit of a preview but the focus here on the chapter we're going to be going through, chapter 22, will deal, for the most part, with the issue of the tribes' loyalties to each other and, more importantly, to the Lord. Last week, I briefly mentioned that now that the conquest of the lands of the west of the Jordan had ended, Soldiers from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh were ready to go home. Last week, we, I shared with you there were a few uh, loose ends that needed to get tied up. But now it's time for these tribes to go home. For over seven years, they had been away from their families on the other side of the Jordan. And now the victorious soldiers free to go home. But as we're about to see, their return home wasn't without incident. In fact, what they did, well-meaning as it was, almost provoked another war. 19th century African-American abolitionist and statesman, Frederick Douglass asserted, there is no progress without struggle. He compared those who want progress without struggle to those who want crops but don't want to plow the ground. Those who want the ocean without the sound of its waves or those who want the sky without the roar of its thunder. In his book, The Reformed Pastor, Richard Baxter asserted, in things that are essential, there must be unity. For instance, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, announces, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God remains forever. <clears throat> Holding on to God's word as our infallible truth source is a church essential. But Baxter reasons, in things that are non-essential, there must be liberty. The Apostle Paul gets uh, at this idea in Romans chapter 14, verse 5. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Not every issue, church, is one of right and wrong. And we must allow for that within the church family. Finally, Baxter posts or uh, says, in all things, there must be charity. In agreement with that, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul encourages Christians to speak the truth in love when there is a point of conflict to be addressed. When these three elements, unity, liberty, and charity are missing in any church or any religious organization, 
a crisis, my friends, is inevitable. And it won't, and it won't be fixed without struggle. For those of you who have been coming to church for a while or have been in church for a while, have been through several churches, within any church, one of the issues that often causes the biggest disruption among believers is a misunderstanding of intentions. It's even happened here among us, among Christians, among believers, among this church. The struggle is finding clarification. And to fix the issue requires honest conversation and mutual acceptance. So here's what I believe this chapter will show us. Since Christ, who is our peace, has reconciled us to him, to himself, and to God, believers are given the ministry of reconciliation by the one who is the reconciler. And I'll get more into that, the explanation to that, um, as I go through this chapter. But for now, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us before we open up his word. Lord, we are so thankful that you have us here. In fact, Lord, we're excited to be here. Hear from you, to learn from you, to grow closer to you, to fall in love with you more. But as your children, we want to be more like Jesus. We want to live more like him. We know that by reading your word, by praying, by coming together corporately as a church, Lord, that that can happen. Lord, and so now as we get into this chapter, Lord, pray that it will speak to each and every one of us, Lord. All those that are watching this and listening to this will also hear powerfully from you. The church today is fractured, it's divided. The devil has found it's a way to, to, to just cause problems here. Lord, you're more powerful than that. We know that you can do some amazing and great things and that the devil doesn't stand a chance against you. So now, Lord, speak to us as we get into your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so broken this, de- this down into this chapter into two sections. And I'll be reading that first section now. Joshua chapter 22, verse 1. And the word of God says, Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, and told them, You have done everything Moses, the Lord's servant, commanded you, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded you. You have not deserted your brothers even once this whole time, but have carried out the requirement of the command of the Lord your God. Now that he has given your brothers rest, just as he promised them, return to your homes in your own land that Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you across the Jordan. Only carefully obey the command instructions, instruction that Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you to love the Lord your God. Walk in all his ways. Keep his commands. Be loyal to him and serve him with all your heart. And all your soul. Joshua blessed them and sent them on their way, and they went to their homes. Moses had given territory to half the tribe of Manasseh in Bashan, but Joshua had given territory to the other half with their brothers on the west side of the Jordan. When Joshua sent them to their homes and blessed them, he said, Return to your homes with great wealth, a huge number of cattle, silver and gold, bronze, iron, 
and a large quantity of clothing. Share the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. The Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites at Shiloh in the land of Canaan and returned to their own land of Gil- Gilead, which they took possession of according to the Lord's command through Moses. When they came to the region of the Jordan in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh built a large, impressive altar there by the Jordan. Then the Israelites heard, heard it and said, Look, the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan at the region of the Jordan on the Israelite side. When the Israelites heard this, the entire Israelite community assembled at Shiloh to go to war against them. The Israelites sent Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest to the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead. They sent ten leaders with him, one, one family leader for each tribe of Israel. All of them were heads of their ancestral families among the clans of Israel. They went to the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead and told them, this is what the Lord's entire community says what is this treachery you have committed today against God, of it, against the God of Israel, by turning away from the Lord and building an altar for yourselves so that you are in rebellion against the Lord today? Wasn't the iniquity of Peor, which brought a plague on the Lord's community, enough for us? We have not cleansed ourselves from it even to this day. And now you would turn away from the Lord? If you rebel against the Lord today, tomorrow, he will be angry with the entire community of Israel. But if the land you possess is defiled, cross over to the land the Lord possesses, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take possession of it among us. But don't rebel against the Lord, or against us by building for yourselves an altar than the altar of the Lord our God. Was an Achan, son of Zerah, unfaithful regarding what was set apart for destruction, bringing wrath on the entire community of Israel? He was not the only one who perished because of his iniquity. In Defeat unbeatable, in defeat unbeatable, in victory unbearable. That's the way Sir Winston Churchill described a British army officer famous in the Second World War. Well, the first half of the, depic- of, uh, the depiction would apply to Joshua, the depiction of that quote from Churchill. Because he knew how to win victory out of defeat. But the last half of that quote doesn't apply at all. For as commander of the Lord's army, Joshua was magnanimous in the way he treated his troops after the victory. An Italian proverb says, It's the blood of the soldier that makes the general great. But this general... This particular general, Joshua, made his soldiers great. This is clearly seen in the way he discharged the tribes who lived on the east side of the Jordan. Here's some ways, again, some amazing ways he he did this. First, in verses 1 through 3, we see that he commended them. These two and a half tribes promised Moses, they would remain in the army until the land was conquered, and they kept their promise. After the death of Moses, they pledged the same loyalty to Joshua, their new leader. And so these tribes have been loyal to Moses, to Joshua, and to their brothers from the other tribes. 
They had been so loyal to their leaders. No, why? That's the question. Why had they been so loyal to their leaders and fellow soldiers? Because they were first of all loyal to the Lord their God. It was his mission that they were carrying out and his name that they were seeking to glorify. In the service of the Lord, far above our devotion to anybody else, anybody, any leader, any ministry leader, any, any person that leads a, 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 has a leadership position in any church, far above a cause or even nation, our devotion is to the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. Secondly, the way he ditch, discharged them there in verse 4. Having fulfilled their mission and had kept their promise, the tribes were now free to go home. For the Lord, the Lord had given his people rest. The concept of rest is important in the book of Joshua. And it means so much more than simply the end of the war. The word carries with it the meaning of both victory and security. And it involves and involved Israel having their resting place in the land. So God promised to give his people rest. We see that he kept his promise. The spiritual application of this rest for us, for God's people, is made in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. See, church, when we trust Christ as Savior, we enter rest because we're no longer at war with God. When we yield ourselves completely to him, and claim our inheritance by faith, we enter into a deeper rest and enjoy our spiritual riches in Christ. Imagine for a moment what would have been like for these soldiers to return, return home after being away for so long. Think of the love they would have experienced, they would experience the joys they would find, the treasures they would share. This here is just a tiny, minute picture of what happens when the children of God enter into the rest God, has, God gives to those who will yield their all to him and trust his word. Another thing we see that made Joshua so great is that he admonished his sold those soldiers. See that in verse 5. Like any good leader, Joshua was more concerned about the spiritual walk of his people than anything else. The army experienced victory in Canaan because Joshua loved the Lord and obeyed his word. And that would be the open secret of Israel's continued peace and prosperity. So just as they had been diligent in battle, obeying their commander, so they must be diligent in worship, obeying the Lord, their God. Which, by the way, was a promise each of the tribes made to the Lord at Mount Gerizim, and Mount Ebal. 
Now, the motive for their obedience had to be love. It had to be love for the Lord their God. See, if they loved him, they would delight in walking in all his ways and obeying his commandments. Instead of trying to serve two masters, they would cling, they would cleave to the Lord and serve him and him alone with all their heart and with all their soul. Remember, this was something Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22. He said, this was the first and greatest commandment. Therefore, to disobey it would mean committing a great sin. He said this in Jesus, our Lord, said this in John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, pay close attention to what he said again here. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And finally, in verses 6 through 8, we see that Joshua blessed those troops. It was a ministry of the high priest to bless God's people. But anybody, any common person can invoke God's blessing on others, especially especially a leader upon his people or a father upon his family. So what a, a sight it must have been to see a great general asking God's blessing on his troops. But this blessing involved, also involved sharing the rich spoils of battle with them and their family members back home. See, it was custom, it was the custom in Israel that those who stayed home or couldn't participate in the battle for some good reason, it was custom for them to also share in the spoils. After all, these people had protected the home cities and kept the, machin the machinery of the community going while the men had been out fighting. And so it was only fair that they share in the spoils. So indeed, two and a half tribes lived east of the Jordan. The two and a half tribes that lived east of the, of the Jordan, as you can see, it was an honorable discharge. And so as the men of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh made their way east and past the landmarks that had brought back memories of great things, the great things that God has done, had done, their hearts began to stir. Their hearts began to disturb them. See, happy as they were going home, it wasn't easy to say goodbye to their brothers and leave, the, leave behind the nearness of the priesthood and the tabernacle. Those of you who have left churches that you loved because you've had to move, or you know what that's like to leave that <coughs> church family and leave that, all those people that you cared about, prayed with, cried with, we know what that's like, and I'm sure many of you also know. But, again, it wasn't easy saying goodbye. They were leaving the land that God had promised to bless. Yes, they were going home to the land that they had chosen for themselves. But somehow, they began to feel isolated from the nation of Israel. This wasn't simply because an, order, an ordinary river would separate the eastern from the western tribes. See, the Jordan River wasn't just a little stream. It wasn't just an ordinary river. Mountains on each side rise to heights 
above 2,000 feet. <clears throat> and the Jordan Valley nestled in between is, in effect, uh, there's a great trench there, 5 to 13 miles wide. So we're not, again, we're not talking about a tiny little stream there. It was massive. Because of this enormous river boundary, you can see that it may have contributed to the fear of these tribesmen that they and their bread, bread, brethren, their brothers, would permanently drift apart. After all, you've heard the saying, out of sight is often out of mind. What then could be done to keep alive the ties, the ties forged by these long years of united struggles? What could be done to symbolize the unity between the people on both sides of the river to remind everyone that they were all children of the promise? The answer suggesting itself to the minds of those soldiers was that they should build an altar, one that could be seen from a great distance, an imposing altar that would witness their right to the original altar at the tabernacle. So they erected such an altar on the Israelite side, on the western side of the Jordan River. Now why, another question that comes to mind is, why didn't they just build some other kind of monument? Well, because they knew that the true basis of their unity was their common worship centered in the sacrifices of the altar. Now, as we read, when Joshua and the Israelites of the nine and a half tribes heard about this, they were angry. They were livid. They were ready to go to war against the two and a half tribes. For seven years, those two tribes, those, all those tribes in the western side, and those in the eastern side had fought alongside each other. They helped each other fight the Canaanite warriors. In fact, the text there describes these men as brothers. Yet there was a move from celebration to what would appear to be a, a civil war all because the nine and a half tribes heard. That's important, that's a key word there. They heard the two and a half military uh, tribal leaders had built an idolatrous altar. Apparently Joshua and the people of the nine and a half tribes thought the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh built this impressive altar to offer sacrifices on it. And as a result of reports that the military personnel of those two and a half tribes and their leaders had done something against the law of Moses, the nine and a half tribes were preparing themselves to go to war against their brothers Think about it. This was a move from celebration to war. So when the committee arrived at Gileoth, Gileoth, they held a, tribun a tribunal and indicted the military personnel of the, of the two and a half tribes. They accused them of being ungrateful accused them of being ungrateful to God who had watched over their families on the wilderness side of the Jordan for seven years. They censured them for not showing gratitude for God's protection of their families and his provision for them. 
they also indicted them for building an, alt an altar to make sacrifices at a place not designated by God in direct violation of Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. So they accused them, they censured them, and indicted them. There in Deuteronomy 12, we're told that sacrifices were only offered at the places that God had designated. Now in this time period, when this was going on, sacrifices could only be offered to him at the tabernacle there at Shiloh. This committee, this committee also indicted the military personnel of, of the two and a half tribes for dishonoring their own place in Israelite history by failing to remain faithful even after seeing God fight for them in battle. Two and a half tribes had a sterling record, but at the end of the seven-year conquest appeared to have forgotten their covenant and were on the verge of bringing God's wrath down on Israel. So this particular part of the passage also revisits number, Numbers chapter 24. There, the Moabite women seduced the Israelite men, and eventually the Israelite men worshipped the false gods of Moab. As a result, Numbers 24.9 says that God killed 24,000 Israelite men. And there... They tell those, those military leaders from Gad, Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh that even to that day, even up to that point, they still were reaping, feeling the effect of that judgment. The leaders of the nine and a half tribes also reminded the two and a half tribes of ancient sin back in Joshua chapter 7. There we read how Achan had taken valuables when the city of, uh, had taken valuables upon the fall of the city of Jericho. This caused God to tell Joshua that Israel lost the battle of Ai because one man had sinned. Because of one man's sin, it affected the whole nation. And so similarly, the action of the two and a half tribes might lead to God's judgment against the entire nation of Israel. And so this tells us that the nine and a half tribes were afraid enough to try to protect God's name by defending his honor. They were worried. And you blame them. After all they had gone through, after the punishments, after all they had seen, for disobeying, for disobeying the Lord. So they needed to do something about it. Now in the next section now that we're going to be reading is the response. The response from those two and a half tribes, from the leaders of those two and a half tribes. So let's pick up in verse 21. Joshua chapter 22, verse 21. The Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh answered the heads of the Israelite clans, the mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows, and may Israel also know, do not spare us today, if it was in rebellion or treachery against the Lord that we have built for ourselves an altar to turn away from him. May the Lord himself hold us accountable if we intended to offer burnt offerings and grain offerings on it or to sacrifice fellowship offerings on it. 
we actually did this from a specific concern that in the future, your descendants might say to our descendants, what relationship do you have with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between us and you, descendants of Reuben and Gad. You have no share in the Lord, so your descendants may cause our descendants to stop fearing the Lord. Therefore, we said, let us take action and build an altar for ourselves, but not for burnt offering or sacrifice. Instead, it is to be a witness between us and you and between the generation after us so that we may carry out the worship of the Lord in the presence with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to our descendants, you have no share in the Lord. We thought that if they, said, if they said this to us or to our generations in the future, we would reply, look at the replica of the Lord's altar that our fathers made, not for burnt offerings or sacrifice, but as a witness between us and you. We would never... We would never, ever rebel against the Lord or turn away from him today by building an altar for burnt offerings, grain offerings, or sacrifice other than the altar of the Lord our God, which is in front of his tabernacle. When the priest Phineas and the community leaders of the heads of Israel clans who were with them heard that the descendants of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, what they had to say, they were pleased Phineas, son of Eliezer, the priest, said to the descendants of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is among us, because you have not committed this treachery against him. As a result, you have rescued the Israelites from the Lord's power. And the priest, then the priest Phineas, son of Eliezer, and the leaders returned from the Reubenites, the Gadites, in the land of Gilead to the Israelites in the land of Canaan and brought back a report to them. The Israelites were pleased with the report and they blessed God. They spoke no more about going to war against them to ravage the land where the Reuben, Reubenites and Gadites lived. So the Reubenites and Gadites named the altar. It is a witness between us and the Lord is God. It is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Clarifying a huge misunderstanding. And that's what these two and a half tribes had to do. So again, we see here, we begin with uh, now the delegation or the committee, they permit the leaders to of those two and a half tribes to respond to the indictments and accusations that were made against them. This scene here is a reminder. It's a reminder to all of us that we shouldn't assume the motives of our brothers and sisters before speaking to them. It's one of the, again, the biggest mistakes that happens within a church, within a fellowship, assuming the motives. You don't know, don't understand. You've heard the saying before, what, what happens when you assume? Don't be that way. If there's a problem, is an issue, you don't understand, reach out to that brother or sister in Christ. It can cause so many problems in the church. Don't assume the motives of our brothers and sisters before speaking to them. Why? Because believers who are reconciled to God through the Spirit of Christ, the perfect example of how to live peaceably with one another, they're given, they're given a ministry of reconciliation to others. So... See here that the two and a half tribes explained 
their actions. They hadn't sinned against God through gratitude, disloyalty, or idolatry. They hadn't brought God's judgment against Israel by building an idolatrous altar for sacrifice. They built the altar as a memorial in part because they knew their brothers. Their action and the reaction to it actually exposed how fickle and forgetful the Israelites were. Two and a half tribes had enough time away from their families to see what was habitual of their nation. Earlier, for a similar reason, Joshua had ordered an altar of stones to be built once the children of Israel had crossed over the Jordan River and camped at Gilgal on the Canaan Canaan side. Joshua had instructed a man from each of the 12 tribes of Israel to go into the Jordan River that God had closed up, gather a stone, carry it to Gilgal, and pile the stones as a memorial so that future, so that when future generations of children ask, what do these stones mean? The response of the adults would be, these stones were drawn out of the Jordan River to help illustrate the story of God's Drawing, uh, God drying up the Jordan River and bringing the children of Israel safely to the other side. These stones here now tell the story of the history of Israel. She had succeeded because God had fought for her. The delegation of the military personnel, there are those two and a half tribes built an altar so that the stones could communicate also an important message. The memorial we built at Gileloth is to recall our history so our descendants will know Canaan was conquered because we participated with the nine and a half tribes. It was a united effort. Their youngest children, after all, had never crossed the Jordan River. They could not testify to the grapes, the Jericho walls, the giants, or the hidden treasures. They weren't there and could not give a firsthand testimony. So these men likely recalled how terrible things had gotten when Pharaoh arose who did not know their great leader, Joseph. Let me repeat that. These men likely recalled how terrible things had gotten when Pharaoh arose, who did not know their great leader, Joseph. The fact of the matter is that these people, these people were prone to forget. The military leaders of the two and a half tribes didn't want to be written out of Jewish history. Their children in future generations might be discouraged by their distance from the Western tribes and be tempted to serve other gods. Unfortunately, history would prove this to be a valid fear. For in a future time, we know this from Judges chapter 2, Israel would not know the Lord or what the Lord had done for them. Friends, stones have a story to tell. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem on Psalm Sunday. Remember? Riding on a donkey. His followers cry out, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But what were some of the religious leaders demanding? We're telling Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And what did Jesus tell them? If they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. In other words, the earth 
itself would protest. Rocks would stop being what they were, silent witnesses to tell what had to be known. Friends, stones have a story to tell. And so when the delegation sent by Joshua to interrogate the military leaders of those two and a half tribes, when they heard their rationale for building this huge and impressive altar, they were pleased and satisfied and no longer talked about going to war against their brothers. This certainly, these certainly were national brothers and some of them were even closer brothers. They were probably men from half the tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh on the east side of the Jordan, who were literal, literal first-generation brothers with people on the other side of the Jordan, on the Canaan side. It would have been a tragedy for those who had been fighting side by side for seven years to now turn on each other and fight face to face. Again, later in Judges chapter 20, this happened. 11 of the 12, 12 tribes, 11 of the tribes of Israel planned to exterminate one of the tribes of Israel, Benjamin, because of a despicable event that had taken place. I won't get into that. Again, the story is in Judges chapter 20, but 11 of those tribes were going to completely wipe out the guilty <coughs> tribe of Benjamin. If this had been carried out to completion, then you know what would have happened? Saul would have never have been the first king of Israel. And Paul would have never been the apostle to the Gentiles who wrote much of the New Testament. You see, both Saul and Paul were from the tribe of Benjamin. So how sad it would have been to have the story without their part of his story. All the potential wouldn't have been realized for there would have been no tribe named Benjamin out of which they could have been born. A similar thing happened in our own nation during the Civil War when brothers from the North and South fought until, until their blood stained the battlefields of our nation and their swollen corpses covered the ground. Today, today, church, we are experiencing intense ideological battles among brothers and sisters in our churches, in our religious institutions, in our, and in our denominational governments. Truly, this must break the heart of God. His son died on the cross that we might live, that you might live. And we're killing each other reputationally, carrying out character assassination with our associations. Can, can we not remember Christ's prayer in John 17, 11? Holy Father, protect them by your name so that we, so that they may be one as we are one. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. The man, Jesus Christ. I repeat something I've been saying before. Believers who are reconciled to God through the Spirit of Christ, the perfect example of how to live peaceably with one another are given a ministry of reconciliation to others. 
it's ours to unite. It is ours to unite with one another through listening, through listening and speaking the truth in love. It's ours to seek God for direction, not to lean on our own understanding. It's ours to seek reconciliation as recipients of the same grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Listen. Listen and speak the truth in love. That's what we must do if we want to see more unity in the church. And this is important also here among your brothers and sisters. Not be so quick to speak. Listen. Especially if there is a misunderstanding. So, in review, this historical narrative from this chapter, Joshua chapter 22, it offers the following reflective lessons. We are never to compromise the convictions we have, which are based on the full counsel of Scripture. Those scriptural convictions are essentials and they're not non-essentials. The church isn't to engage in an effort to be politically or societally correct. For the church, the Bible, and I've said this before, the Bible transcends the Bill of Rights Calvary's Hill transcends Capitol Hill. The cross transcends the flag. God transcends our government. And the right house, my father's house, your father's house, transcends the White House. The church for that matter, also Christian organizations must participate in collaboration. The delegates of the nine and a half tribes and those of the two and a half tribes collaborated. They talked even if the topics were sensitive and the matters difficult. We can no longer accept monologues. We must participate in dialogues. Although di the diagnosis, although the diagnoses are significant in order to treat and transform our ailments and illnesses, we must have prescriptions. Leaders of the two and a half tribes, as well as the others, the other nine and a half tribes were also both culpable in some way. They, all, they both had some guilt, were guilty in some way. If the leaders of the two and a half tribes had informed Joshua and his leaders before leaving for home on the east side of the Jordan that they were going to build this impressive altar at Gililoth for the purpose of a memorial and not for sacrifice, and all this could have been avoided. There would have been no reason to plan to go to war against them. On the other hand, if Joshua and his leaders had inquired, had inquired of the Lord in order to discern from God why the leaders of the two and a half tribes had built this altar, then they would have put themselves in a position to have God reveal to them that the leaders of the two and a half tribes had built this altar for a worthy and noble purpose, that of remembrance. The Gibeonites had been able to deceive Joshua and his leaders as to who they actually were, 
not people from a faraway land with moldy bread and cracked wineskins, but their neighbors. Joshua chapter 9 verse 14 declares that the Gibeonites were able to deceive them because Joshua and his leaders did not seek the Lord's decision. Every, and here's where I'm getting at, every church leader, those of us who are leaders and who want to lead, even those who are leading Christian organizations, they must be willing to acknowledge their own culpability in the problems we face and not simply play the blame game. Oh, it's their fault. No, it's important that we look at ourselves first and ask ourselves, where am I? Am I the problem? Am I the issue? Am I looking at this the wrong way? Am I taking this the wrong way? I'm almost done here. Now, of course, Adam and Eve was the first to do this when he blamed God. I'm sorry, Adam was the first one to do this when he blamed God for giving him Eve. The woman you gave me, Lord. <laughs> and blamed Eve for giving him the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil instead of blaming himself. Eve blamed the serpent for deceiving her. Now, yes, this is a great story. That story there, it's, it's, it's great. But there's an even greater story. A crisis occurred in the Garden of Eden. The reason for the crisis? Sin. Adam and Eve sinned. The result of the crisis? Adam and Eve were evicted from the Garden of Eden. The responsible decision in relation to the crisis, God would send his son, Jesus, as the incarnate one. In John chapter 1 verse 14 declares, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The redemption from the crisis, Christ will not only come in the incarnation, he would die on the cross during the crucifixion and be raised from the dead in the resurrection. He would restore unity. He, our Savior, would restore unity. Friends, church, those watching, I, many of you probably are hearing this and you know, you know about that crisis. You know about what happened there in Eden and as a result of Adam and Eve because of them every single person is a sinner and we now because of them there needs to be reconciliation there's been there's enmity between man and God and the only person that was able to bring that reconciliation is Jesus Christ he alone, nobody else, not any other religious figure, nobody, but Jesus. Jesus told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. If this is something you now believe and you want your sins to be forgiven, I want to invite you to the cross to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be born again. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. 
and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for all you've done for me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.